Hello, Royal History Geeks, it's Gareth here, continuing the series on Margaret Beaufort. Sorry about the delay, I got waylaid with other things, but I'm back now. So, this episode? Do we call it episode? I don't know, probably not episode. This clip is looking at the relationship between Margaret and Elizabeth Woodville, the um, sometime Queen of England, the Yorkist Queen of Edward the Fourth, her sometime ally, ally, um, and perhaps sometime friend, and perhaps sometime rival. We're exploring some of that today. There's quite a lot of interest in the subject of what Elizabeth and Margaret's relationship might have been, partly because I think interest was peaked a few years ago around the White Queen series, or, or the, the the White Queen and the Red Queen books by Philippa Gregory, which I think are very good, very strong, although should be read, I think, in conjunction with other historical books, but but are very good. I, I've, I enjoyed them both immensely. The series I also enjoyed, but would really want anybody watching them to to be to be reading other things too to make sure they're checking their facts. Um, and of course, America are currently being treated to the White Princess, the sequel to the White Queen, which if you know the book is anything to go by, then probably the rivalry um, between Margaret and Elizabeth, I imagine, comes up quite strongly in that, although we in the UK have yet to be treated to the series. I hope that we do get to see it in time, because I do enjoy, I do enjoy these things, even if I'm part of the camp that says, oh, but guys, please do read some other things. I do actually enjoy watching them. So anyway, what was the relationship between Margaret and Elizabeth like? Well, we have indications, um, as you can imagine, we don't know. Um, but Margaret would probably have started to get to know Elizabeth properly in 1472, which isn't to say that they never met or encountered each other before. But in 1472, she marries Thomas Lord Stanley, her third proper husband, fourth if you want to be really technical about it, who is big in the Yorkist court. Margaret obviously is more firmly linked to the Lancastrian um, affinity, although we know she's pretty apt at playing both sides when, when she has to, and she's she's already emerging as a great survivor. But her roots, her roots lie um, in the other camp. However, with Thomas Lord Stanley very prominent at court, she starts to spend more time there. She starts to become influential. She starts to get her face seen. And she starts, in one way or another, plotting uh, for the restoration of her son. That her son, at this point, Henry, the future Henry the Seventh, has been has been exiled or, or voluntarily exiled himself uh, to away from England to to Brittany because he arguably is the closest Lancastrian claim to the throne. And Edward the Fourth seems pretty pretty keen to get all Lancastrian blood. Um, off the scene, so and he 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 he, um, he 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 does a mass killing basically of, of potential Lancastrians just after he wins the battle um, of of Tewkesbury a couple a couple of years before Margaret's second marriage, and as a result, she thinks it's best that she get, that his her son gets out of the country where he's definitely safe, and she's working behind the scenes. She's not trying to get him king at this stage. She doesn't she doesn't think that's possible. No one thinks that's possible really. Um, what she wants is him to come back to England, to be given lands, to be restored to his title, the Earl of Richmond, and to be able to live a happy, contented life as much as that was ever possible in medieval England. So that's, I'm just, just going, just re-rehearsing all of that, just to remind ourselves of the context of why it's good and important for Margaret to be at court, to be someone of influence. Now, obviously, during this time, she would have encountered Elizabeth Woodville heavily and um, so the question is how did they get on in this capacity one question a few people have asked me is how did how did margaret a, a fierce lancastrian manage to get on with and serve as a lady in waiting to a yorkist queen elizabeth woodville i have to say i've, I've had another look i can't find any reference to margaret ever actually serving elizabeth woodville as one of her ladies i think think about if you've got one if you can find one let me know I, I mean i know it's in i know it's in the the white queen um tv series but i don't think i've come across it anywhere else if, if i've missed it i apologize but let me know where you've seen it all i would say 
as if she was directly in the Queen's service in that sense. She wouldn't have been, you know, a low-ranking lady-in-waiting. She wouldn't have been you know, changing the bedsheets and stuff. She'd been one of the, one of the great ladies uh, of, of the court. She, she was a countess. She was from a very, very uh, prestigious family the Beauforts, she was she was wealthy in her own right and of course she was a descendant of, of Edward the Third. So she she's 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 maybe not royalty but she's the next notch down from it. So she's not going to be doing anything menial or, or demeaning. I think it's really important to make that point. But anyway, I don't think that was her role. I think she was a frequent visitor to court. She would have encountered the Queen. So in the broader sense the Queen would have been the most senior lady, she would have been considerably beneath that, so that sense would be in, in her service, but I think that's as far as it went. We do know that she was involved in some quite important stuff. She is is, is high profile in 1476 at the reburial of um, Richard, Duke of York, who had of course been killed in the very early stages of the Wars of the Roses, and this is a big ceremonial occasion, really to vindicate the House of York and, and to show the world how, how powerful they are. Margaret is there, and she is honoured, and she, she has a big role. She also is made a goddaughter to the King and Queen's, to, to a daughter, of the king and queen, and later evidence suggests she may have had some some kind of healthy relationship with with the king, queens, and other daughters, the York princesses, as well. So this is suggestive of the fact that maybe everybody's getting along quite well. Um, maybe there's an element of people seeking reconciliation. Margaret, to an extent, still represents a Lancastrian affinity. So showing that that's now all ultimately under the under the service of York would have would have been in everybody's best interest and it presents Margaret with an opportunity to demonstrate her loyalty as well. But one question in terms of whether Margaret would have would have felt this conflict of loyalties, her with her Lancastrian blood, here serving either either the Queen or the Court of York more generally. I think it's just to ask that question is to slightly misunderstand Margaret Belford. She of course her affinity was the House of Lancaster. She was a descendant of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. She um was known to hugely admire Henry the 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 sixth, her cousin, who her second cousin, who was the last Lancastrian king, and she continued to to, to she continued to um, always remember him and to honour his memory, trying to get him sainted, all that sort of stuff for for the rest of of her life. And there is some suggestion as well that maybe she did consider herself the the heiress to the to the to the uh, throne of Lancaster and was able to transmit that claim to her son but nonetheless she was a pragmatist as were most people in that era her 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 second third uh, her her, 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 uh, her second proper husband Henry Stafford had actually fought for York in the latter stages of the wars of the roses she had before that she'd entertained edward the fourth uh, and she as much as anything wanted i think to keep her head down and to to, to guarantee the survival of herself and the, and the people that she cared about and it's worth remembering as well that there's a lot of there's some great articles now i really encourage if you're interested in the wars of the roses i really encourage people to, to dig around for these they show the wars of the roses wasn't wasn't as binary as maybe we've traditionally um been tempted to think of it was it wasn't quite as straightforward as everyone was was either york or lancaster and that was it and you stuck to that side and, and nothing else happened at the end of the day most people were just quite keen to back winners and to protect themselves and to prosper under under a regime where patronage very much flowed from the centre and the person of the king, and everyone really wanted to be on the right side of whoever was in power at the time. Yes, Margaret perhaps had a, had, a, had a firmer affinity to one side because of her blood origins, but don't forget, all the nobles were pretty much related. They're all kind of cousins in one way or another. Well, not all of them, but many were. So if you take, for example, Margaret, she's actually a slightly closer genetic relation to Edward the Fourth than she was to Henry the Sixth. She's she's second cousin to both, but that's through a half brother, um, a half sibling relationship on the on the Henry the the Sixth side, and a full sibling relationship on the Edward the Fourth side. Now that's not how Margaret would have seen it as such, because she she took her affinity from her father's side, the Beauforts, the House of Beaufort, affiliated very strongly to the House of Lancaster, almost like the kind of second division of the House of Lancaster. But but nonetheless, it's worth remembering that Margaret 
well, nobody in those days saw it quite as binary as York versus Lancaster, and Margaret in particular looks like she was a pragmatist, that she did the right thing for her survival and the survival of the people that she cared about. So probably, did she like having to bow down to to Elizabeth Woodfall? I don't know that she would have given it much thought. I think she would have accepted that that's the way things were at this stage. Um, did she like the fact that the Yorks were in power? Probably not. Was she prepared to make a peace with that? I think so. What she want, she knew what she wanted most, which was her son's return, her own security, and the security and safety of her wider family that she cared about and, and who she loved. So, of course, then you've got the next phase of the relationship between Elizabeth and Margaret, the co-conspirators. Because after Edward IV dies, Richard III seizes the throne. Margaret, again, keeps herself in at court quite well with her husband. They make sure that they're, they're able to play both sides, I think, if they want to. But in the end, once it becomes clear that the princes have been killed, and the princes in the tower were killed, I really do believe in 1483, and I really do believe it was under the, the orders of Richard III. But anyway, let's not get into that now. Margaret and Elizabeth come together and say, let's get our children married, Henry Tudor, to marry Elizabeth of York, to unite York and Lancaster, and together we can overthrow Richard III. Well, does this suggest huge pers personal chemistry? It doesn't have to. They may have got on well and that may have happened. We don't really know. But it does certainly show that both women are pragmatists looking to do the best for themselves and their children. Whether they had any mutual animosity, I mean, there's no evidence they did at this stage. I don't think they would necessarily have been thinking about it in that way anyway. But if they did, they were obviously able to put that aside and come together and do what they thought was the best thing for themselves, for their children, and probably what they thought was the best thing for the country as well. They are ultimately victorious. In 1485, Henry Tudor lands with an army. He takes the throne in the Battle of Boswell Field from Richard III, becomes Henry VII, the first king of the House of Tudor, and most of um, his wife, who he marries, he marries Elizabeth of York, and most of her relations, including her mother, are then returned to court. An act of parliament is passed that gives them back the titles and dignities they'd lost under Richard III, and they're, they're restored to favour. And for a couple of years, it seems that that, that, that worked okay-ish. There's, um, however, something clearly goes wrong. In 1487, Elizabeth Woodville is banished from court under the fairly flimsy pretext of that she'd, she'd, she'd co collaborated with Richard III back in 1483 when she didn't really have much choice. She was, she was starving um, in sanctuary and needed really to, to come out and make her peace with him in, in some form. But anyway... Um, in 1487, under that flimsy pretext, she is, is sent away to live a religious life uh, where Henry VII can reduce his expenditure on her. And she's treated very well. She's treated regally um, in living in an abbey. Um, and she's treated like the Queen, Queen Dowager that she is. She is given money from Henry. She does get money uh, from the Exchequer, um, but, but perhaps not as, as she might have expected as a Queen Dowager. There is some suggestion, and David Stark has been very vocal on this, that this is Margaret's doing, that she can't possibly handle having to give precedence to a woman, Elizabeth Woodall, who was actually crowned queen. Margaret's got semi-regal status. She's she's known as the um, as my lady, the king's mother. She will go on to sign herself Margaret R. She's not doing that at this stage, but Margaret R., which could be Richmond, her title, or it could be Regina, meaning queen. That's how a queen would sign. Either way, she leaves that deliberately ambiguous. She does claim queen mother status, and she probably doesn't like having another queen mother around. Starkey says that I think there's probably something in it. Um, interestingly, at the birth of their first grandchild, um, Prince Arthur, who will go on to become Prince of Wales, the christening, Elizabeth Woodville is the godmother. Margaret doesn't attend. That could be suggestive of something. Um, or it could not be. I mean, she might just have been unwell or, you know, having her hair done that day. I'm obviously joking about having her hair done that day. But but it could just be something as simple as, as she wasn't well. We, we, we don't know. But it could well be that there's something in this theory that Margaret cannot 
uh, get on with Elizabeth Woodville and therefore she can't handle giving precedence. There is plenty of evidence. I love, I really love Margaret Murphy, but I'm afraid there just is plenty of evidence that she was quite proud, quite aware of her position and wanted to do everything she could to assert her position. Maybe we can talk about that in another clip. That could have contributed to Elizabeth Woodville's banishment but it also might not be it could be it's possible there was there was a rebellion supposedly in favor of the earl of warwick um who was the son of, of george duke of clarence the brother of edward the fourth to restore a yorkist um heir to the throne and put him put put him in in henry tudor's place and it's possible that they thought somehow elizabeth woodville was connected to that which certainly would have been a good reason to banish her but it seems slightly unlikely that she would support a boy that you know her nephew effectively her nephew by marriage who and she she'd hated she'd hated his father george duke of clarence they've been big enemies so it's, it's, it doesn't seem very likely that she'd support him over ultimately her own grandson although some have suggested that maybe you know it was just a it was it was a it was a pretense and they could have then put prince arthur then. i don't know i think it's unlikely but it's possible it could just be i'm an alison weir suggests isn't that excellent biography of elizabeth of york it could be money you know henry as we know famously wasn't wasn't one to loosen the purse strings more than he had to he had a mother to support Margaret Beaufort. He had a queen to support. He didn't really want to be supporting a queen dowager as well. So there we go. At the end of the day, and I want to keep saying this, when it comes to relationships, uh, occasionally with people we have letters and, and tokens that suggest what they might have felt, but ultimately they stored they store their true feelings in their hearts and they've, they've taken them with them and maybe we'll never, we'll never fully know. But Margaret the Pragmatist would have looked at Elizabeth Woodville as someone she needed to impress and ingratiate herself to uh, in, in, in the years when Elizabeth was Queen and she and Margaret would have made her peace with doing that. She then saw her as an ally, someone she could work with and potentially toward the end she did see her as a rival and someone she then had the power to sideline. What their personal relationship with any of that is is difficult to say but I doubt it was one of the tense rivalry stroke hatred that we sometimes see in historical fiction. Thank you and I'll see you soon.